Good morning. Welcome to Porton Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank those who are watching by Facebook, Judy Glennie's Facebook page. Uh, we're live on Facebook. We're also on the YouTube. If you go to the website, portlandbiblechurch.com, in the top of the homepage, it has services. There's a drop-down menu, and you can go there. There's a link there to YouTube, so you can follow us there as well. At our website, we have uh, probably over two years of videos, so you can check that out. And we have many, many doctrinal studies, probably about 80-plus doctrinal studies that are in print. You can download or read at your leisure uh, and uh, use for your own Bible study if you so desire. So we have that information. We also have a number of audios going back several years, so you can check those out at portlandbiblechurch.com. Our services, of course, are at 10 o'clock right now on Sunday morning, 11.15. We have another service. These services are consecutive. That is to say we're studying the book of Hebrews and we're in chapter 10 currently. And so uh, the second service will follow the first service uh, in terms of the book of Hebrews. On Thursday, we have class on uh, at seven o'clock. And of course, so we are studying the book of Ephesians. We just got started on that. We have quite a few uh, interesting studies that we've already looked at and more to come. So if you can be with us on Thursday night, seven o'clock. After our Thursday night class, we have about a uh, half hour or so of prayer meeting. So uh, <laughs> till the prayers run out and the needs, uh, which seem to be inexhaustible these days. So if you have prayer requests, praises, thanksgiving, let us know and we'll be sure to include you in our prayer agenda. Okay, a couple of announcements here. We've got, uh, of course, uh, the film that was put out by Dinesh D'Souza and others called 2000 Mules. If you haven't seen that, you can go to the website uh, that is SalemNow.com. Check that out. I think you can even view it there. And so uh, basically it deals with uh, how the 2020 election was corrupted. Obviously, uh, I think I mentioned it was 2020, but it's 2000 uh, or 2000, but it's 2020. 2000 Mules is the name of it, but the election was 2020. At any rate, you can view that. Uh, and that's 2000 Mules. It's at SalemNow.com. Also, you can go to PatriotAcademy.com, and there you'll find uh, information on the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, uh, the Founding Fathers, all kinds of documentary evidence for the great nation that we live in and put out by Rick Green and David Barton. So you can check that out, PatriotAcademy.com. I have several publications. We've been mentioning them. So we have this publication uh, put out by the Chosen People Ministry to the Hebrew people. It's called uh, Isaiah 53 Explained. If you haven't gotten one of these, we have several here. Uh, we'll send them out to you or the people here. You can pick them up on our book table in the back, uh, Isaiah 53. We've taught it in the past, but it just goes through in detail all the information that pertains to, prophetically, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly good for the Hebrew people so that they can find uh, their Messiah, but also for us because we're studying right now in Hebrews, so we need the background information, and that gives us a great deal of background information as well. And the other one, of course, is pertinent today, and that is freedom through military victory. Some of you have this one. We still have a number of copies here. This was put out by Robert Thiem years ago. It's been updated and enhanced and has a great many things. We used this when we were looking at the principles of leadership. Also has the uh, principles of divine establishment. God has ordained for the entire human race. But uh, in addition to that, of course, the whole concept of freedom through military victory. And of course, today we recognize the freedom that we have through the military victories uh, over the centuries within our own nation. So those are the publications that we have. And uh, it is our custom to take a few moments for silent prayer at the beginning of each of our Bible studies. And that is so that we can uh, exercise the ministry of the filling of the Holy Spirit by confession of sins. We believe that 1 John 1, 9, among other passages, teach us that we need to confess our sins on a regular basis. The Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance those sins so that we can acknowledge or confess them. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we believers confess our sins, name them, cite them, agree with God that their sins 
he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, that means that our sins are forgiven based on the work of the cross. And when we mention them retroactively, it picks those up. And also all unrighteousness refers to those things perhaps that we had forgotten or just didn't know about. So we take some time at the beginning of each of our classes for silent prayer for the opportunity to acknowledge any sins to the Father. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study this morning, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we are so grateful for the freedom that we still possess in this country, freedom that has been gained over the centuries through the, the efforts and military prowess of our citizenry, male and female, and those who have gone into combat to defend our nation against all aggression, in fact, to establish our nation early on uh, and to deliver us from the tyranny that was coming uh, from the British Empire early on. Nevertheless, freedom comes through military victory, that is national freedom. The freedom of the soul comes through faith alone in your son, Jesus Christ, and we are grateful for that. And we can never repay that, but of course you've given to us as a grace basis, uh, and therefore we thank you for these things. We pray now as we study this morning that you'd encourage, challenge, and motivate us by the things we study. We pray it in Christ's name, amen. Before I go into the service this morning, I wanted to recognize the fact that tomorrow is uh, Memorial Day, and so uh, many people, of course, put out flags, and that's certainly a noble thing to do, but uh, basically it's to remember those who have given their lives or certainly in service uh, to this nation over the centuries, and of course we can go all the way back to the founding of the nation. Those men pledged their lives and their fortunes and their honor uh, for the establishing of the Constitution and this nation. And so down through the decades, uh, men that have given their lives and have fought for this nation to defend its freedom from all comers uh, are remembered. And so there's something called the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. So I'm going to look at some of those in just a moment. Memorial Day itself is all about remembering. And as I say, remembering, uh, you can go back into the archives and discover literally hundreds and hundreds of men and women who have uh, served this nation to defend freedom, and a great percentage of these have given their lives for freedom. So Memorial Day is a day about remembering these individuals and uh, being thankful that they were willing to serve and in many cases to offer up their lives. And it's about values, it's about beliefs, it's about victories, even victories uh, and defeats. Uh, it's an observation that uh, is held annually, usually the last Monday in May in most states in the United States. Uh, it's in honor of the nation's soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, all those who are in military service who were killed in combat. So obviously some were not, but I say a great percentage. As I was looking through the Medal of Honor citation winners, it seems like the greatest percentage of those have given their lives. Some of them managed to escape uh, simply with uh, terrible uh, bodily injuries, but a great many of them gave their lives and were, and were given the Medal of Honor posthumously uh, rather than in person. And so the holiday is usually commemorated by parades and speeches and ceremonies and the decoration of graves uh, of these military dead uh, with flowers and flags. But more than that, I think sometimes we need to actually recognize what did some of these individuals do. Memorial Day was first observed May 30th, 1868 on the order of General John Alexander Logan in commemoration of the Civil War dead, so the great conflagration of the Civil War. It was observed on May 30th until 1971 when most states began to adhere to the federal holiday observation schedule, which brings it to this coming Monday, which is tomorrow. So that's basically the information dealing with Memorial Day, but I wanted to look at some of these individuals and actually read their citation. Many years ago, I studied under Pastor Robert Thiem, and one thing that he used to do on Memorial Day, Veterans Day, 4th of July, any of the holidays that commemorated the greatness of our nation, he would cite and reference many of these individuals who were cited uh, in the 
a Medal of Honor a winner's uh, record. And so there are a number, of, I have several volumes of this, and uh, even up to and including the latest conflagrations out there. And so uh, what I, my era was the Vietnam era. We have looked at uh, War II, that was my dad's era, and we've looked at some of those, just literally hundreds of individuals that had outstanding above and beyond the call of duty service. And so as uh, Pastor Thiem used to read these, I thought uh, that uh, I don't know how many other pastors do this, but to me, really commemorating these individuals is what Memorial Day is all about. Yes, we can put out a flag, but when we see what people did in terms of giving their lives for this nation and for freedom, it helps to bring home the importance of the freedom that we possess today. We've been very fortunate, most of us through our lives have not had to go into a combat situation. Some of you have, but many have not gone through that. And yet we see even now uh, a people fighting for freedom in the Ukraine. And so they are under fire. Their nation is basically rubble. And yet they continue to fight on because they believe in freedom as we as a nation do, and at least once did, sometimes we wonder about the current population of our country. But freedom is the real issue. And so the first Congressional Medal of Honor was awarded in 1863. That's 159 years ago. And of course, the Vietnam era was uh, the era that I was involved. I did not go to Vietnam, but I was in the service during that time. And I got out of the service just before it got really ugly. And of course, uh, beyond that, 1966, all the way up to 1973, it was pretty horrible. And so uh, the Vietnam era was about 1964 to 1973. And of course, I was in from 64 to 66. So that's my era. So I have a particular burden. And I hope I can say this, but when I went to Washington and saw the wall, uh, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's just, a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to see. And I didn't, I, I lost friends there. And of course, uh, I was not on that wall, but uh, just observing these men and, and women who gave their lives, it was pretty outstanding. At any rate, uh, I wanted to give a couple citations here to show you the kind of individuals that have delivered the freedom that we have today, and you might say, as some did in my era, well, Vietnam's not our problem. But the basic concept of freedom, no matter where it is, in Ukraine, Vietnam, Korea, you name it, it hasn't been to our shore yet, even World War II uh, wasn't really our fight. But of course, it ended up becoming our fight when uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. So we entered the war. So even though the war doesn't seem to be in our backyard, uh, we nevertheless are responsible for freedom wherever it is found and helping those people who are fighting for freedom, whether it's just logistics or giving arms. At any rate, one citation here by an individual. This is a fellow by the name of Phineas D. McCleary. He was a platoon sergeant. One of the things that I noticed is we have everything from private first class all the way up to majors and uh, captains and higher level officers who gave their lives for the freedom of our nation. So it's not uh, when you're in the service, no matter what your rank is, uh, if you have the honor code of the military, you may become an ordinary citizen who becomes an outstanding hero in combat. He was a platoon sergeant, United States Army Company A, 1st Battalion, 6th United States Infantry, and this is in uh, Quang Tin Province, Republic of Vietnam. I may not be saying it correctly, but basically this was in May 14th of 1968. And of course, uh, he entered the service in uh, San Angelo's, Texas. And uh, his citation reads as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Platoon Sergeant Finney D. McCleary, United States Army, distinguished himself on 14 May of 1968 while serving as platoon leader, the 1st Infantry of Company A. 1st uh, Battalion, 6th United States Infantry. On that date, a combined force was assigned the mission of assaulting a reinforced company of North Vietnam Army regulars well entrenched on Hill 352. I want to pause there for a moment. These guys were going to fight to gain uh, the uh, hill and that was what they, that was their objective. And so we think small objectives sometimes in life are very, very important. And so you say, gee, they gained a hill? And, of course, maybe subsequently that hill was taken again by the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, Viet Cong. Nevertheless, that was their mission, and they were going to do the job that, uh, that they were commanded to do. 
and therefore they went to this hill, 352, 17 miles west of Tom K. Uh, Quang, uh, uh, Quang Tin province, if I have it right. Mm -hmm. Sergeant McCleary led his men up the hill uh, uh, and across an open area to close with the enemy. His platoon and other friendly elements were pinned down by a tremendous tremendously heavy fire coming from the fortified enemy positions. Realizing the severe damage that the enemy could inflict on the combined force in the event that their attack was completely halted, Sergeant McCleary rose from his sheltered position and began a one-man assault on the bunker complex. With extraordinary courage, he moved across 60 meters of open ground as bullets struck around him and rockets and grenades literally exploded at his feet. As he came within 20, 30 meters of the key enemy position, uh, Bunker, Sergeant McCleary began firing furiously from the hip and throwing hand grenades. At this point in his assault, he was painfully wounded by shrapnel, but with complete disregard for his wound, he continued his advance on the key bunker and killed all of its occupants. Having successfully uh, climbed to the top of the bunker he had uh, just captured and in full view of the enemy, shouted encouragement to his men to follow his assault, and the friendly forces moved forward. Sergeant McCleary began a lateral assault on the enemy bunker uh, line, just going down the line from bunker to bunker. I mean, he was on top of it, and all these enemies were basically at his feet. Sergeant McCleary began this literal assault. He continued to expose himself to intense enemy fire as he moved from bunker to bunker, destroying each in turn. He was wounded a second time by shrapnel as he destroyed the and, and routed the enemy from the hill. Sergeant McCleary is personally credited with eliminating several key enemy positions and inspiring the assault that resulted in gaining control of Hill 352. His extraordinary heroism at the risk of his own life show um, uh, 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 above and beyond the call of duty was in keeping with the highest standards of the military service and reflects great credit on him, the American Division, and the United States Army. Now, that's just one of literally hundreds of citations of uh, average citizens who took it upon themselves to step out, to step forward, and take the reins of that particular situation in hand, and basically defeat and even rout the enemy, even in this case where they were simply taking one hill. Then there's another fellow I want to read, and that we'll do two of them because I think it's important. This is something that needs to be done on these holidays when we commemorate our veterans, rather than just putting up a flag and saluting the flag, as wonderful and as noble as that is. This individual is Jose Francisco Jimenez, Lance Corporal, United States Marine Corps. Company K, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marine, 1st Marine uh, Division. And this is in Quang Nang Province, Republic of Vietnam, 28 August, 1969. He entered in Phoenix, Arizona. Of course, he was born in Mexico City, Mexico. His citation reads as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a fire team leader with Company K and battalion, uh, uh, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marine, 1st Marine Division, in operations against the enemy in the Republic of <clears throat> Vietnam on 28 August 1969. On that date, Lance Corporal Jimenez's unit came under heavy attack by North Vietnamese Army soldier regulars, concealed in a well-camouflaged emplacement. Lance Corporal Jimenez reacted by seizing the initiative and plunging forward towards the enemy position. His per he personally destroyed several enemy personnel and silenced an anti-aircraft weapon, shouting again encouragement to his comrades. Isn't that amazing? Uh, they're out there in front of full view of the enemies being shot at and, uh, and encouraging others to back them up. Lance Corporal Jimenez continued his aggressive forward movement. He slowly maneuvered to within 10 feet of the hostile soldiers who were fi firing automatic weapons from the trenches, and in the face of vicious enemy fire, he destroyed the position, although he was by now the target of concentrated fire from hostile gunners uh, intent upon ha halting his assault, I guess. Lance Corporal Jimenez continued to press forward as he moved to attack another enemy soldier. 
Uh, he was mortally wounded, as many of these were. The other fellow there, Phineas McClary, he managed to make it through only being wounded. But the great percentage of individuals in the Congressional Medal of Honor Citation group uh, did not make it out. And so it says here, Lance Corporal Jimenez, indomitable courage, his aggressive uh, fighting spirit, and un uh, unfaltering uh, devotion to duty uphold the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and of the United States Naval Service. He was attached, of course, uh, to the Naval Service at that time. So these kind of individuals, regular guys, and I'm sure ladies as well, but we have men in the service at this time, and therefore we see that these are the individuals who gave their lives or certainly gave uh, uh, every opportunity for the enemy to wipe them out for freedom, freedom for the Vietnamese. Now, this is freedom, of course, all over the world, and so uh, our nation is no exception. There may come a time in our nation when we have to fight for freedom, not only from those without, but from those within. By the way, we're going to study in the next chapter in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, basically God's Medal of Honor winners. There we have a catalog of the uh, divine Medal of Honor winners that is there in, Revel in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and they are cataloged there, the great heroes of the faith, not all of them, but certainly those who did outstanding and were heroic in their own time and their own way. So we might say that the divine Medal of Honor winners are located in your Bible in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. God has said, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, open the word of truth this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And if you have the outline, by the way, you can get the outline at the website. And it's under the doctrines, uh, under the, doc, uh, under the uh, outline section. We have a doctrine section and the outline section. And there in chapter 10, uh, when we go down, we're in the last section under the sufficiency of the Messiah's sacrifice, his once and for all sacrifice. Point three went from verses 10, uh, verse 11 through 14, so we're in the midst of it. Messiah's sacrifice was perfect and final. And so while the establishment of national freedom is something that has to be uh, won in every generation of any nation that is to maintain freedom, Jesus Christ gained our freedom, spiritually speaking, when he died on the cross from sin and from death once and for all. And so we see that perfect and final sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you go over with me to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 13, Basically, uh, we're in a section here that continues from verse 11, as we noted. Excuse me. So I'll read it from verse 11, and then we'll pick it up in verse 13. So in verse 11 here it says, And every priest, speaking of the Levitical, Levitical priesthood from the line of Aaron, and every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. We noted the fact that they simply covered over the sin, if you will, anticipating the Messiah who would come and take away sin once and for all, part of the great theme of the writer of Hebrews in his epistle. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And verse 13, where we continue, says, waiting. So Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father in terms of the picture that we have. I always try to see a picture. You can't see uh, God because God is uh, uh, spirit and is everywhere at once. Yet in terms of our understanding, it makes sense to us. Uh, so this is basically uh, an anthropomorphism, if you will. It, uh, it gives the appearance of God in a form that we can understand, even though it's beyond our comprehension. However, the 
humanity of Jesus Christ in a glorified resurrection body has to be somewhere. And so the scripture says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And uh, whatever that means in terms of the reality of God's nature and his omnipresence, uh, we're not told. So that's about the best we can do. So if he can visualize mm -hmm. uh, the Father on one seat and Jesus Christ seated right next to him, that's about the best we can do in terms of that picture. It's beyond our human comprehension, but the scripture uses this anthropopathic method so that we can have some idea of what that is. Some have suggested, well, how's he building the new Jerusalem, our heavenly home, if he stays seated? Well, I think the seated idea is a picture that he is at the right hand of the Father, and uh, the idea of sitting forever in a chair uh, is not something that Jesus Christ is doing. He's the creator of the universe, so he doesn't just sit down and kick back and never get out of his chair, so to speak. It's a picture of his relationship with the Father and his resurrected body. At any rate, uh, here we come then to this particular verse, and it says, waiting from that time onward. And so he is expecting or waiting. We have the Greek word ek dekomai. Dekomai means to expect or to wait. Ek, the preposition that's uh, appended to it, uh, intensifies it. So waiting out from or waiting for, looking forward to the time when he will come out of his position, as it were, seated at the right hand of the Father. And we know what he's going to do because, first of all, he's got to come to take us at the rapture of the church, so he'll say, certainly get up for that because we're going to meet him in the air. So wherever the third heaven is, he comes down at least into the first heaven and takes us, the bride, uh, to go into heaven for the marriage for that seven-year period. At the end of that time, he will come back to earth uh, after the wedding ceremony, and we'll have the destruction of the Antichrist and all those things that are part of what are called the Armageddon campaign, which Jesus Christ will be victorious over. And then he will usher in that millennial kingdom with all of the things that are attached to it, such as the marriage supper that will occur. We would call that the reception, you see, at the end of that seven-year period. And so, of course, here in verse 13, then, we see that he's going to come, and here it says, until he makes his enemies a footstool for his feet. The idea of making the enemies the footstool is found in a number of passages. Probably the earliest passage that we have is over in the book of Psalms. And we noted Psalm 110. We don't have to go there right now, but you might just add that here. We've looked at it numerous times. We have everything there from Jesus Christ as being the second member of the Trinity uh, and the fact that he is going to rule in the kingdom and that he is, of course, seated at the right hand of the Father. And then it continues on to the Armageddon campaign, simply mentioned uh, uh, very cryptically, and the Millennial Kingdom at the very end as he walks by and refreshes himself. So it's a brief, uh, a brief psalm. Nevertheless, it has incredible import, and it's one of the places, the earliest probably, where we see the second member of the Trinity seated at the right hand of the Father. Of course, our verse here, we also see it in Zechariah uh, chapter 14, verse 4. We noted that he will stop, uh, stop at the Mount of Olives uh, after the victory. In fact, it's the victory celebration. The 144,000 will be there the uh, remnant of Israel that are delivered, uh, and they, uh, the 144,000 evangelists, plus other remnant that will receive resurrection body. I'm, I'm just mystified as to how we're going to all be on that Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. But the church age, the bride of Christ will be there, and uh, we'll be there on our horses, and uh, just a great time. At any rate, that is in brief in Zechariah 14.4. And in Ezekiel 43, 7, we also have reference to it. Let's go over there since we haven't been there lately. For those who have joined us previously, you remember then in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, we have a presentation of the future millennial kingdom in which Jesus Christ will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we have all the details more details, in fact, than most people realize of what's going on during that time of the millennium. So if you want to know what the future holds, you can go and study Ezekiel 40 through 48. I have to tell you, first of all, the first chapters, uh, Ezekiel 1 up through chapter 39, are tough because all those chapters deal with the discipline of Israel. But the glory comes at the end in chapter 40 through 48. And so in chapter 43 of Ezekiel, 43, verse 7, it says this, And he said to me, 
That is, God said to Ezekiel, probably the second member of the Trinity who is speaking. He said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the sons of Israel forever, and the home of Israel will not be defiled. My holy name, neither they nor their kings, by their harlotry and by their corpses of the kings when they die. And so he continues on, and he spoke, speaks about this in verse 9 again. He says, I will dwell among them forever. And of course, then he begins to describe the millennial temple at that point. So we have this pericope, just a small portion where it talks about his touching down and being a part of the victory celebration over the armies of the Antichrist in the fulfillment and destruction uh, in the Armageddon campaign. So there's the footstool. And of course, we see it elsewhere, one that we haven't looked at, perhaps uh, we could see over in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, just another one to add to your list here. Psalm 8, verse 6. I know in some churches they have the overhead and the PowerPoint and they flash it on the screen. We make you look it up in your Bible. Psalm 8 and verse 6. And here it says, Thou dost make him to rule over the works of thy hand, and thou hast put all things, listen to this, under his feet. And so we have here just another pericope, just another little passage tucked in there in this particular psalm, which addresses his being uh, on the Mount of uh, Olives, and of course having the enemies, as it were, under his feet obviously the judgment. Now the enemies will also be under his feet at the end of the millennial kingdom, but these passages in the Old Testament particularly, and most of the references in Ezekiel and in Zechariah referred to the second advent and the enemies there. The last enemy, of course, to be destroyed is death, and of course Satan and the uh, 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 unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire. That's the last enemy at the end of the millennial kingdom. But this is speaking about the second advent. And so his enemies are put under his feet. And then in the New Testament, uh, in addition to our passage, we can go over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15, one of the truly great passages uh, written to the Corinthians dealing with uh, salvation and resurrection and all things in terms of the information to the dispensation of the church. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 and 26, just those two verses without getting sidetracked into the wonderful passages that are before and after it. And so we see here in verse 25, he, referring to Jesus Christ, must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. This, of course, refers back to the, or refers to the end of the millennial kingdom. So at that time, all the enemies, those who have come to fore during the kingdom, yes, in perfect environment, there will be some, it says a great multitude come before the city of Jerusalem and before the Lord and attempt to once again destroy him. So not just once, but twice. Second advent, the Armageddon campaign, he quashes that. And at the end of the millennial kingdom, a short time, Satan will be released and he will garner he will garner support from a great number of people. Uh, the good thing to know about that, while it's extremely future to our day, is that God's not going to mess around anymore. He simply wipes them out with the fire from heaven, and that's it. He doesn't uh, he doesn't uh, do a whole lot of fighting and all of that as he does at the Armageddon campaign and its closure. He simply wipes them out. So here he must reign. Well, the reign refers to the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Notice here, this is not second advent. This is the end of the millennium because it says the last enemy that will be abolished is death. And he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is expected uh, who put all things in subjection to him. And here we have, of course, a reference to God the Father. And so the Father is seen in the work and person of the Son. Last place, Ephesians chapter 1. Now, for those who are studying with us on Thursday, we're going to come to that probably in about three years because we're in chapter 1. 
uh, I jest, but there's so many powerful doctrines that we need to study in chapter one. Uh, a friend of ours was teaching a book of Ephesians, and I think they did it in about five or six weeks. Well, I think we have about almost that amount of time, and we're up to verse four, I think, or at the end of verse three at least. So it takes a little time. I make no apology for that because every jot, every tittle, as Jesus said, is important. Every phrase, every concept, every word in the word of God is essential for our understanding. And so we are those who are faithful in studying to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, handling accurately, rightly dividing the word of truth. So in Ephesians chapter 1, all the way down in verse 22, we read this. And he, that is God the Father in the context here, put all things in subjection under his, that is Jesus Christ's feet. And he gave him, that is Jesus Christ, as head over all things uh, uh, to the church, which is his body and the fullness of him, that is the one who fills all in all. And the one who fills all in all there, we believe this is again the Father. So again, we look at the two members of the Trinity working here in unison. So this verse then, verse 13, says, from that time on or until, he is waiting until his enemies are put as a footstool for his feet. The first time, and that of course is the second advent, it will occur once again at the end of the millennial kingdom. Now if you're new with us this morning, you may wonder what I'm talking about in terms of this millennial kingdom and the second advent, the Armageddon campaign, all of these things I have taught in the past, I do not have time to develop them all now. This is for serious students of the Word of God. Hope you'll stay with us. I remember the first time I started studying this way, I was kind of lost. And some of you, if this is your first visit, you might be lost. Don't feel bad. Just study and stay with us. This is a one-room schoolhouse. We teach everything from first grade to graduate school uh, in one setting. And so there's something for everybody. There are principles for baby believers, adolescent, and uh, teenage believers, and mature believers. There's something for everyone because it's the Word of God. So be patient with yourself. I know when I first started studying this way, I was impatient because I'm the kind of guy, I want to know the whole story. I want it all right now. Just dump it all on me. Well, you can't do that. You can't learn calculus when you first go into a math class. You have to go through basic training. You have to learn arithmetic. And then you have to have a concept of the algebra and going up through figures and geometry and trigonometry. And eventually, you have the background to go into the calculus. And beyond calculus, there is a plethora of other mathematical things that they are still uncovering to this day. We haven't come to the end of it because math, of course, is the divine mechanism whereby God has designed the universe. But that's another story for another time. So that takes us through verse 13, brings us to Hebrews chapter 10 and 14. Again, we're going to have repetition. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And eventually we're going to get to application. I've often had people come in my congregation and say, Pastor, we'd like you to do more application. Well, we do some. The application is what you do under the mystery, ministry of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God as the basis. But you also have to have a theological basis for why you believe and what you believe and what you do with that belief. So we have been getting in these first 10 chapters up to this point and really up to verse 20, we've been getting the theology of why it is that we apply the principles of the word of God, why we believe in Jesus Christ, why we even believe in God. All of these things have been given to us by the writer of Hebrews in these first 10 chapters up to verse 20. In fact, 19 through 21 is the bridge, and we'll talk about it when we get there. 19, 20, and 21 is the bridge from theology to the application which ensues for the remainder of the text of the book of Hebrews, with a uh, parenthetical break mm -hmm. for the honor roll, the uh, uh, Medal of Honor winners, if you will, the biblical divine Medal of Honor winners in chapter 11. So other than that, we have come to the place in verse 22 of application, and we'll see that a little bit later. But back to our verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. By one offering, we have the same Greek word we've seen over and over, which is pros pharaoh. Pharaoh means to carry, uh, where we get the word ferry, to ferry across a, uh, a water 
river or, or something where you have a boat that takes you across because there's no other access. It means to carry. Pros means before. So to carry before is the literal sense, and it means to bring before the Lord, to carry in front of uh, yourself and present to the Lord. And so the Father was presented by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and therefore by one offering, putting it into a nominal form here uh, in the dative. And this, of course, is a dative of, uh, of, of means, because by means of this offering, we see that he has perfected unto perpetuity those who have been sanctified. Now, we might see the he here as the son, uh, because he's the one who perfected into perpetuity, and he is the one who offered, but the Father is the author, so there's no way to be specific as to the relative, uh, the personal pronoun he, referring to Jesus Christ or the Father. At any rate, by one offering he, that is God the Father and or the Son, has perfected unto perpetuity. The idea of perfecting comes from a word that we've seen many, many times. It's the verb teleao. Teleao is the word that means to complete, to perfect, uh, to bring to a closure. And so uh, in terms of God's work, it refers to perfection. In terms of our lives, it refers to spiritual maturity because we never reach perfection in this life because of our old sin nature. I suspect that we do reach perfection when we get our glorified resurrection body. In the meantime, we reach spiritual maturity and hopefully function during that maturity. But here, by one offering, he made perfect, we might say. He has perfected. Great translation. Interesting, this is what we call the perfect tense in the Greek. The perfect tense I love in Greek because it indicates work that is done at a time in the past, yet the results continue on into the future and beyond. And so we see here he has perfected in the past, and it continues on. The active voice, he is the one who did it. Christ did the work of the cross. The Father planned the whole work. And of course, uh, it is the act of voice because he is the one who did it. And the indicative mood in this Greek language refers to reality. So Jesus Christ really was the one who did it and he brought it to perfection, and he is perfected unto perpetuity. Uh, we see this word uh, not a lot of times. Uh, Matthew uses it quite a bit, <laughs> writing to the Hebrew people, and the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews. Uh, the other writers use it very, very rarely. One indication, perhaps, that uh, Paul is not the author, because uh, rarely, I think only once or twice in Paul's epistles, does he use this, and yet multiple times do we see it uh, in the book of Hebrews, and that is the word uh, dianekes, D-I-A-N-E-K-E-S, D-I-E-N-E-K-E-S, dianekes, uh, which means uh, perpetuity, on and on and on. And it has with it the preposition ace, E-I-S, which means unto perpetuity. In other words, forever and ever, basically, once and for all time. And therefore it says, for by means of one offering, he, the Father, and Jesus Christ in particular, has brought to perfection unto perpetuity, unto the very end of eternity, if you please, those having been sanctified. We have here the verb hagiadzo. Hagiadzo, many of you have studied with me, and we used to put it up on the board, and I'd write it out. Uh, but uh, we see that a lot of people could care less about the Greek. But the Greek and the Hebrew are essential to understanding the morphology and the specificity of the language in the Bible. English is a translation, after all, and therefore sometimes needs clarification based on the original autograph, or at least those copies that we trust uh, that are accurate. This particular word, hagiadzo, uh, where we get holy, the word hagias means holy. Holy means set apart. So it means to be set apart. At the moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been set apart for a holy purpose. Now, some people don't live a holy life, and they fail that holy design and purpose that God has designed for them. Nevertheless, they do have uh, this uh, setting aside as kind of like I usually use the illustration of a, a royal family, such as the British royal family. Uh, many of those are supposedly royalty. Well, uh, we are true nobility and royalty in the family of God, now, not just a, a, a family inheritance, but rather the inheritance we have through Jesus Christ. So we are nobility. 
But just as the royal family in England and other royal families in uh, times of uh, the past, we see that those who are born into that do not always live up to that nobility. Mm -hmm. They do not always act humbly or nobly. And it's true with believers in Jesus Christ. You're set apart. You are nobility. You're part of the royal family. But are you behaving like royalty? Well, we have to train. Nobility has to train their young. And so it is with Christendom. We must be taught and be trained to live the nobility that we have been given by virtue of being set apart unto that nobility at the moment of salvation. So uh, kind of giving a little background on this word, and I love it here. It says, those having been sanctified. Now, the first word is having, and that takes us back to this perfect tense. That indicates the time when Christ died on the cross, and he sanctified us even though many of us hadn't even been born. And when we believe retroactively, we experience that sanctification that he did once and for all for us. It is in the past, and the results go on in perpetuity, according to the previous word, DNA case. So perfect tense in the past. It's the passive voice. Now, we that uh, don't study much grammar in English, uh, we have uh, sometimes a hard time with these concepts, but it's important. And the passive voice means that we have been sanctified by God through the work of Christ. We do not sanctify ourselves. And I don't have time to develop it, but some think that in certain churches, uh, the hierarchy can cause you to become a saint or to become a sanctified person. Can't be. You cannot be sanctified by some other person. <clears throat> no matter how many good works you do, and somebody says, oh, you're very saintly. Well, it's, a, it's an idiom, but unless you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you ain't. The only people who are saints are those who are saints by belief in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. You cannot be given sainthood by some other person in the hierarchy of a church and say, you are now a saint. Well, I was a saint when I believed in Jesus Christ. No one can take it away. No one can give it to me, and they can't give it to anyone else. Only God. It's the passive voice. You receive it at the moment of salvation when you believe in Jesus Christ. Interestingly, this is in a participial form. Again, that's one of those things in English grammar that people kind of uh, 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 raise their eyes. You know, if you talk about a gerund or an infinitive, they go, what is that? Well, a participle is a verb that has usually in English ing, going, running, jumping. It's kind of a verbal form that acts like a noun. And so here the idea of being in a state of sanctification continually from the time that you believed in Jesus Christ. So the participle shows ongoing action. It extends the perfect tense and its completed action into the present and into the future. So we have been sanctified in the past with results that go on forever. We're sanctified passive voice by God the Father and it's ongoing action in present time and therefore with the uh, pronoun, in this case the definite article acting as a pronoun or a demonstrative pronoun we might say, those having been sanctified. Well, we're going to come back in the second hour and pick it up there because I want to spend a little more time with this concept of salvation sanctification at the point of faith. We've already noted several phases of sanctification. Sanctification permanently at the moment you believe. Daily sanctification, that's where you learn to live as a noble, as a member of God's royal family. And uh, eventually we have the ultimate sanctification, as some have termed it, termed it. And that's when we get to be with the Lord and get our resurrection body. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of studying these passages and all of the theology that's involved. We thank you that Jesus Christ once and for all provided for us this so great marvelous salvation that we possess and every blessing in this life and the blessings that accrue to us for our resurrection body. All of these things courtesy of our faith alone in Christ alone once and for all time. And for that one person who's here this morning without Christ, without hope and without eternal life, we want you to know God had you personally in mind when Jesus Christ came into human history as a member of the Godhead, totally God, undiminished deity, true humanity in one person forever. And he took upon himself the mantle of Messiah, the anointment and the appointment from God to be the Messiah and to go to the cross and be the Savior. John said, behold the Lamb of God 
which takes away the sin of the world, that is the whole world. And so you can have everlasting life. You can have forgiveness of sins totally. You will have a glorified resurrection body in the future. And oh, by the way, you get to join with us at that communion table. It's called the marriage supper of the lamb and some 60 or 70 other things that accrue to you as blessings, plus any rewards that you receive courtesy of production done under the filling of the spirit. Won't you do it? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God himself so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son, his only born son, that whosoever, stop there for a moment, anybody, whosoever, would believe, believe is the issue, would not perish but have everlasting life. Won't you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross? When you do in the silence and privacy of your own soul, that's the moment of your eternal salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again so much for the opportunity of studying these treasures, these areas of theology, which give us the basis for everything that we do in this life as believers. We pray that we continue on, that you guide and direct us so that we do those things. <clears throat> that are pleasing in your sight and come into your presence and hear <clears throat> those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray all these things in the matchless and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.